Welcome one and all to the NHF 2020 virtual conference and the lecture, Nipping Pain in the Bud, the Science Behind Medical Marijuana. It's my pleasure to introduce Khalid Namus. He has achieved his Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences at the University of Southern California and has been a cancer researcher for four years at USC's Cancer Biolab under Dr. Landolf. He has also been a researcher in Dr. Luck's lab at the Orthopedic Institute for Children working on late infections and is currently working on a CBD study investigating pain relief for people with hemarthropathy. He's presently a fourth year medical student at UCLA and we are so fortunate to have him here with us today to unpack the science of medical marijuana. You know, as a healthcare con consumer, it's, it's really difficult to, to really know what's going on and frankly difficult to sort out the positive or negative hype from established scientific fact. It's hard to know how safe it is uh, to know what CBD can and can't do and what we don't know yet. And Khalid is going to help us unravel a bit of the mystery with his expert specialization to help guide us and our clinical decisions with his insights and perspectives. Khalid Namos, it's a delight to have you here and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it was a pleasure really to, to be on here and to you know, help give back in, in uh, any way I possibly could. So um, to begin the presentation, um, this is about nipping pain in the, nipping pain in the bud, um, kind of the science behind medical marijuana and even more specifically into uh, CBD. Uh, I, just from my cl uh, clinical experience this last year, I've, I've run into a lot of patients and a lot of people that are on CBD. And um, that's, that initially piqued my curiosity because you know, there's, there's a lot of different pain modalities and a lot of different things going on. Um, like lidocaine patches, you have all your different things, and a, and a lot. Of, I noticed a lot of the patients using CBD, uh, and so piqued my interest and uh, wanted to find out a little bit more about it. So, uh, a little bit of background about me. Um, again, uh, went to USC, got a bachelor's of science in biological sciences. Um, I worked uh, with the LA County Keck USC Cancer Research Center with, under Dr. Landoff for a few years, um, and then right now I'm with the uh, Dr. Luck in uh, the orthopedic, the OIC, um, and just trying to learn as much about research uh, as possible and, and how to, you know, learn, learn from the best, I guess. <laughs> uh, between my second and third year, I actually, I took a year off and I started a marketing company. So that's like a little fun fact. Um, for uh, disclosure, generally the marketing company was selling hand sanitizers. That's what we ended up doing. Uh, initially, we actually did consult a CBD company and it was more about how to teach them how to make certain formulations for pain creams, how to stay more evidence-based, um, and how to stay within the law when marketing uh, and, and safety labels that you, they should put on. But the brand failed to make it to the market, failed to, to do any of that, so maybe I wasn't that good at it, I'm not sure, but <laughs> my consulting. But um, other, you know, other than that, full-time medical student right now, focusing on uh, research and residency applications. So the general content, this is just a general breakdown of the goals that I wanted to discuss and then the next slide will be a little bit more specific targets of some of the learning objectives that we should go over. So I'll do a general introduction um, on, on uh, cannabis, the hemp plant, THC, CBD. Um, the, you know, then I'll go into the pharmacokinetics of it, the mechanisms of action, and we'll go into the toxicities and the adverse effects that I think, you know, healthcare providers or even just family members of loved ones taking it, everybody should be aware of these. Um, and then at the very end, it's kind of like the funner part, or not the funner part, it's, for, for me, the first part's the funner part, but for other people, it's probably the latter. Uh, you know, the legality of CBD, uh, marijuana products, and just generally the industry and just things to look out for um, while, while sifting through this information. Um, so, questions that we're going to specifically hit, and this is kind of the order of the presentation in a way to, to keep everybody um, organized on it. It's so, uh, again, general intro, mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics, potential uh, benefits, then side effects. Then we'll go into polypharmacy. Polypharmacy as, you know, you, you have people taking multiple drugs at the same time. Uh, what should you be aware of and what, what are some red flags? Uh, and then cur current research um, on pain, maybe CBD is a pain reliever and then the legal implications. So 
to begin, um, I thought it'd be beneficial to go over what is CBD, what is a hemp plant, and what is this thing that everybody is taking? Is it marijuana? Um, if you take it, will you go to, you know, will your blood show up with THC in you, or what, you know, what are, what are, what is it, right? So pretty much you have, um, a lot of them are derived from the cannabis uh, plant, the sativa plant. Now, you can breed different plants to grow different things. You can breed them and, and they'll have different levels of THC. And these varying levels of THC, um, and generally in the marijuana plant, um, you'd have different effects out of it, right? Um, with hemp, what they've done is they've actually grown it so that the THC content is really low. Low to the point to where when you give it to, to take it to market, it should be under 0.3%. Um, and then when we go over the pharmacokinetics and the oral, the bioavailability of it, you'll see that you're not really getting any THC out of these um, plants, which is, you know, uh, makes it different. And that's why I think the FDA and uh, the, the regulating bodies um, are making the laws the way they are because you have your marijuana plant, which has high levels of THC, so it could really alter, alter you. And then you have your hemp plants, which are a lot significantly less, quite, you know, 0.3 almost negligible concentrations of THC or even less. So then you can get into the, the distillation processes and the ways to get it down to zero. You know, you, you can get a hemp plant and then you can isolate this, the cannabinoids from it to where it's like 100% CBD, no THC in it at all. So for this reason, I think the CBD spread across the country was seen rapidly. Um, you can, I mean, it's even on, on Amazon right now, you could see some form of a hemp derived CBD product. Uh, in general, so I wanted to get, again, more, this slide is more about the specifics of CBD and what are the different things that you might see. And, and the reason this is important is because when you see people purchasing this or using it or consuming it, it is good to know what's in there. Um, you have, uh, over here, as you can see, I don't know if you guys can see the pointer, um, you have your full spectrum all the way down to your narrow spectrum. Um, you, and, and as you go down, you can see you can go down to distillate, go into isolate, you know, at the very top, you're at your cannabis flower. So what they do is they take this plant and then they just take out everything and they just concentrate the CBD as, as much as possible as they go all the way down. Now, these are kind of the different things that they use to extract it. Some use CO2, some use, then you then use lipids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're trying to do is just get this one cannabinoid out, which is the CBD. So I can also take a step back. The different cannabinoids you have, there's many different cannabinoids in the, in the plant. And the one that we're really highlighting here is like the CBD one at the, at the very end. So the more you extract it, the more you isolate it, the more you get down to it, the less THC you're going to have. So if you're at the isolate, your THC contents should almost be near zero. Um, if you're at the distillate, it's going to be higher. If you go up the full spectrum, it's even higher. And this comes into play because you'll have different products, for example, gummies that will have full spectrum CBD in it. And, you know, people will take one of those and they'll feel very sleepy. They'll have more effects or almost closer to what you would see in marijuana. Not marijuana, but more towards that end of the spectrum. Versus the isolate, when you take the isolate, it's just, you know, some argue it does absolutely nothing at all. It's a complete marketing ploy. It's just something that you're using the name of a plant to sell a product. So they say isolate in it. So you have different opinions on that in the just out in the world right now. Um, but we'll get into a little bit later why the isolate actually might work, but maybe it's just not dosed high enough in certain products. So that's why people say it does nothing. It's, it's kind of like just a marketing uh, term. So the routes of consumption that you will see a lot of people taking in your this is going to be more, well, it's CBD and, and this is also your THC products, but I'd like to kind of keep them separate. So during this discussion, I'm going to refer to marijuana, THC, and then hemp and CBD to kind of keep things organized um, as we discuss them. 
But for both products, whether you're talking about THC products or CBD products, you're seeing a lot of people do topicals now. The, that's pretty new where they'll put it in some sort of a lotion or a cream and they'll just rub it on their skin. Uh, some people say put it behind your ears. Some people say put it directly on where you're having pain or, or whatever uh, modality you want. So that's the topical route. You also have your oral route. Um, usually these come in like a tincture. If you guys have seen those, and it's a, like a fluid, like a little thing with just oil in it with uh, CBD, just put in that, and people will just take two droplets under their tongue. Um, I've seen this. There's inhalation, and with inhalation, there I've actually seen multiple modalities of, of inhalation that was very interesting. There is your, um, you can inhale it through a, like a pre-roll, um, where you actually just light it and smoke it almost like a cigarette. There is vapes where you can put it and vaporize it. That's later we'll talk about that associated with the ARDS, so you don't want to step into that category as much. And then you have um, some of these almost inhalers. That, that was the most um, interesting to me, seeing some of these inhaler products where people just use it kind of like an asthma inhaler to, to, to get it into their lungs. And then uh, transdermal, topical, same thing, and then you're at your sublingual. There's some of these pills that people put under their um, tongue. Okay, so um, before I get, get into this talk, I felt like this slide was pretty important um, because there's many different studies going on, and you're going to hear family and friends and members in the community swear by this. You're going to have patients swear by it, and then some patients will do some research uh, about it, and then they'll discuss the research that they've done um, on it. And then, you know, and this, this honestly, this goes not, this isn't even just applicable to CBD. I mean, you could take this into, you, you know, your COVID treatment research. You can, you can apply this to really anything. So I wanted to kind of give a, a, a good general background. Um, so the first thing is you have your basic science research. You have your animal research studies. Um, and you'll find there's, there's a good amount of CBD animal research, uh, studies. You know, they had one on rats where they put between 60 gram, milligrams to 6 to 60 grams, and they found that rat arm didn't have as much pain or something like that. You're going to get <clears throat> a lot of these, but this generally hits the con A lot of people link these and use those as sources of how CBD cures pretty much everything, because um, you also do have those people. And then you have your clinical research where you actually use it on, on patients. And then then you have your peer-reviewed big bodies, a lot of evidence um, type of research. So as I go down through this discussion, I kind of want to point out the big body of evidence research, and then we, and then there's also going to be your smaller clinical research trials, your more your independent ones. So um, again, a lot of people are going to cite these clinical research trials. Um, for example, you know I, there's some European studies investigating it, CBD with COVID. There's, but you know, these are just small studies. They're going to have their biases. They're going to have their confounds. And then you're going to, we're going to, I'm going to try to stick to here, the peer reviewed big evidence ones. So we have a good general idea of what happens. And then with this tab right here, we can kind of predict maybe where the future is going or, you know, some, some things that are interesting in the field. So right now for the big peer reviewed ones, um, I like focusing on the FDA indicated drugs, the ones that are in this. That, that are in our system right now. Um, the first one is Epidiolex, uh, cannabidiol for generic name, CBD. It's going to call it CBD. Uh, the second brand, the THC brand, is uh, Dronobinol. And I know I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. That's a THC synthetic analog. So uh, these are interesting because, because they've had a lot of money, a lot of research, a lot of background into them. We can, we can get a realistic um, view of what these compounds do and their side effect profiles, what drugs they can, in, they interact with and what drugs they don't. So the, the most evidence and the most accurate evidence is actually from these. And a lot of these are on uh, up to date. Uh, so you can, it will cite the meta-analysis, it'll cite um, a big body of, of, of research behind it to kind of to back up what you're trying to say. So in general, you have your CBD, your CBD receptors, or your CB, your cannabinoid receptors um, in your body. And you have your CB1 receptors, you have your CB2 receptors. Um, the thought is that, you know, 
CBD will hit more on the, uh, the CB2 receptors and then THC predominantly the CB1 and maybe some CB2. Um, that's kind of the general thought when you talk to a lot of people um, about this. Um, the four major groups that we do know are associated with the CB1 receptors, and this is where the THC would hit, are the, the four major feelings you'll get is you'll get your euphoria and your easy laughter, your affective group. You have your sensory group, so you, that increased perception of external stimuli and knowing your own body. Um, somatic feelings, so the feeling of the body floating or sinking in bed. Um, your cognitive, which is your you know, distortion of time, perception, memory lapses, maybe your di uh, difficulty in, in concentration. So that's like more of the CB1. Now, the CB2 receptors, just based off of, um, uh, I think it was like no Northern blotting that, that they did this, they found that it was located mainly in the spleen or all over the body, the immune system in general. So the immune system, spleen, tonsils, your thymus, um, also, they found it to be related to your cytokine release system, your cytokine storming. They found it in immune cells like monocytes, macrophages, beta cells, and T cells. So this is predominantly an investigation of where they think CBD really hits. I want to be clear that this isn't, it's, for CBD, it is largely unknown right now. There's not a huge body of evidence saying, boom, this is it, but this is the thought is that it, it might be hitting the CB2, but again, when they did the big clinical research style, idiopathic, they, have no, they don't really know where it hits. In fact, the Epidiolox study, which we'll go into later, found no evidence of, of it even hitting these. Um, so, but, but again, this is, this, is, this is kind of the idea. Now, the reason cytokine release is important um, for me, and I, I'll point it out right here, is, so I'll talk about that later. Cytokine release. Cytokine release, if, if you look at uh, current COVID patients, uh, one of the things in it is that they pass away from is a cytokine storm where, you know, it's just like an overreactive immune response, especially in the lungs that comes and it causes fibrosis and it just destroys your lung tissue. So this is thought to modulate that. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll move on here. So activation is CB1. Um, produces the marijuana-like effects on the psyche and cir circulation, whereas the CB2 receptor doesn't. Now, this is the, ex yeah, the exact mechanism of action of cannabinoid is unknown. Um, it doesn't appear to be involved in the cannabinoid receptors. So this is the study on epi uh, epidiolex saying, found an up-to-date saying, mm, there's really not that substantial amount of evidence that even hits the CB2 receptors. However, Again, that's the thought, and when you talk to people out in the world, they're going to cite the CB2 receptor and the THC hitting the CB1 receptor, so just, just to kind of have a better understanding of where, that, where the evidence actually is on that. So THC, how does it seem to work? So again, we look at drobenol, which is your THC1 synthetic analog, um, and that one we do know, you know a little bit about. It has equal affinity for the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, but the efficacy is less at the CB2 receptors. So again, if the CB2, you're thinking immune system um, and those type of cells, a little bit less there, um, more of the other effects that we mentioned with CB1. So most of the effects from it, um, analgesia, appetite enhancement, yeah, again, muscle relaxation, your hormonal, it's by the central cannabinoid receptors and their dis distribution uh, showing kind of the medical and adverse effects. And that was done by the groton Herman study. So the indications, what are the indications for CBD? Where can you, where does, where do we say yes, take it? This is a, a drug that's for your health benefit and the FDA said use it for this reason. Right now it's associated with these ch uh, child uh, epilepsy syndrome. So you have Lennox Gastaut and you have Dravet syndrome. And these are in children over two years old. So it is, can be used for suppression of seizures. Um, so this kind of goes back to that conversation where some people say, oh, well, the CBD doesn't do anything at all. Well, it does actually. Um, but, you know, how do you concentrate it well? Where do you get the enough of a concentration for it to actually work? And what concentration is it that actually works? And, and where are we with all these things? And does it do all the other things that, it, that people say it does? This is the only strong evidence 
of CBD doing stuff to people. So this is where we can comfortably say, yes, this will work for these things. For these other things, further research is really required. Other, until then, it's more, more or less anecdotal. So the net effects of CBD. Um, this is by, uh, the, here's the, the, the study that I sorted there. Um, so the net effects generally anti-inflammatory. Um, so immune-mediated disorders, including autoimmune conditions and neurodegeneration. Um, again, the suppression of cytokines. We talked about the cytokine storming. Suppression of effector T cells. Your microglial cells, these are in your brain. Um, and it's, so it suppresses your microglial uh, cells and just your overall host of pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2. But this is, again, not that. This is uh, a little study here where they think that it, that it could. I would say it's more anti-inflammatory immune mediated. On the epidiolex study, the effect of, uh, they actually noticed a lot of patients have an increased amount of uh, infections due to being on CBD. So it, it almost shows that kind of the dangers, which we'll talk about later about people taking it for a COVID cure, which some people also swear by. So the THC indications. Um, so that's, again, the closest thing with the most evidence that we have around it are the uh, drop, uh, dronabinol, which is your THC synthetic analog. Again, it's not your marijuana plant, just what people usually use. It's, it's more of that, but it's a good learning point. Um, the indications are anorexia in patients with uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And then off-label seems to help people with obstructive sleep apnea. So these are some of the indications for that. Now, this next slide, it's, it's more of a transition into the mechanism of what we're going to go by, and I, I thought it'd be pretty helpful to do a little review of first-pass metabolism. Um, first-pass metabolism, so in general, CBD and your THC, just a quick little one-liner, are metabolized heavily by the liver. You have the system that, you have your CYP system that actually breaks it down, which is really important later for drug-drug inter interactions. So when you have a lot of patients with, that are taking CBD or they're taking anti-epileptic drugs or um, uh, mood, mood drugs or antipsychotics or whatever it is, it is important to know what drugs they're on because a lot of the interaction does happen right here in the liver. Now, other people will want to know um, what is the best modality of taking CBD? You know, is it the oral tinctures? Is it transdermally? Is it where, where is it taken in best? Um, so we found that about, if you take it through the oral route here, most of it, as you see, will actually end up going into the lumen of your GI, and then it goes through this thing called the portal system. So the portal system is a set of um, vessels that will take the blood straight into the liver called your portal vein system uh, network, and then it'll process it there before it goes into your systemic circulation. And that's, here's the little process as it goes down through here and it goes up there. Now, when it hits this system, 90% of it's going to be metabolized by the liver. Now, if you take it through other routes, more, more um, like maybe a transdermal route, or even if you do a rectal route, uh, you're going to bypass this system. So the bioavailability is probably going to be a little bit higher um, through those other routes. Um, now transitioning into the pharmacokinetics, how fast does this get into your blood system? Um, so with THC, we know that it is detectable within and peak concentrations in like three to 10 minutes, onset within 60 minutes, uh, no, peak THC concentration two to four hours after ingestion. Um, and here we're going into more of the pharmacokinetics of this, and this is again through uh, Dronabinol, you can get this from up to date, and you can kind of see. So the duration, one year on THC, it should last between four to six hours. So the question of how long patients are on this, about four to six hours, uh, not, sorry, how long the effects are, four to six hours, it's biphasic. So initial peak, four to six hours, and then it seems to um, continue in your system. So after 24 hours, that's where you'll get your appetite sim simulation. Um, as mentioned, in the last slide, your oral bioavailability here is 90 to 95%. Um, so it goes through your liver. It's going to um, end up in your – only about 10% of it will make it to your bloodstream. Now, the volume of distribution here is about 10 liters per kg. So it's pretty high. 
um, and just a quick recap on volume of distribution. It's just how much of the blood will be, uh, how much of the product is going to be distributed to your, to the, all the tissues in your body and out of your bloodstream. How much do you need to, um, for it to stay in your, your systemic uh, circulatory system? So the higher the VD, probably the more lipophilic it is. So this drug they found to be very lipophilic, which makes sense. Um, and the protein binding is 97%. So for clinicians, one thing you could do is reference albumin and we'll get into that later. So the, fir yeah, the first pass hepatic, uh, generally through the microsomal hydroxylation of metabolites, um, half-life elim elimination, uh, about four to five hours, terminal 25 to 36 hours, and your time to peak about almost half an hour to four hours. Excretion is predominantly 50% through uh, feces and about 10% through urine. So then you know that it's renally excreted. And, yeah, okay. uh, now for CBD, similar, but one, one thing that I'll point out is your volume of distribution is a little bit higher in CBD. So you can um, see that. Right? Again, the, the, what's it called? Yeah, so um, one other thing they notice is that high fat and high calorie meals may increase the extent of the absorption. And even with THC, they found that if you eat a high calorie meal, a high fat meal with it, um, the time to peak in the blood actually is longer. So the duration is longer. It absorbs. It, it's an interesting finding. So if you have a patient with a high fatty meal or, or on a McDonald's diet, something to consider. Um, and then the half-life elimination, about 56 hours, time to peak, two and a half hours. And a lot of this, again, is from uh, up-to-date excre excretion predominantly through feces. Okay. Um, this quick summary of the bioavailability, we kind of went over that. Um, this is an interesting chart. I, I like the way it kind of broke it down. Um, again, the, this information, a lot, this is from up-to-date on their drug profiles. This is your synthetic and this is your, your synthetic THC, and then you have your actual CBD. And then here, I just like this chart because it, it was, you know, I, I felt the way it was organized a little bit um, easier. So it kind of summarizes your systemic bioavailability um, and some of the different things. So THC in a chocolate cookie, sesame oil, <laughs> and uh, a cigarette for inhalation, rectal, and it kind of shows, you know, as we did mention, earlier, the bioavailability, 120 to 220 of the oral, so significantly higher. Um, so um, again, in summary, what that really means is your, your oral seems to, to destroy a lot of the product versus the rectal, IV, transdermal, better source to get it into your system. Um, transdermal, some animal studies suggest almost 45%. Um, again, I haven't, the, the evidence here is in this, the other slides I mentioned were what we know, this is we, uh, weaker evidence. Uh, there's different thoughts to this as well in terms of what, if you have a product like the transdermal pain cream, for example, um, it is known that depending on the carrier oil or depending on what you put inside of it could actually increase skin penetration. So a lot of uh, companies that make these CBD products will use um, coconut oil. It's pretty cheap. It's with your skin. It's nice, natural. Um, but you know, is it the best to penetrate your skin? Mm, there's probably, there's like better carrier oils, I'd say, but, um, you'll see a lot of this is lecithin good. Lecithin was known to kind of help increase penetration into your skin to kind of get it more transdermal. Again, I think with such lipophilic character to CBD in general, maybe these things don't matter so much, but these are just certain things you'll see. I've, I've even seen, um, people talk about hyaluronic acid because it says, oh, that increases your lipid penetration in the skin. And, and all of this, but uh, some other people say that'll, uh, you know, interact with the CBD in some way. Not really sure how, but they'd say it probably stops its use. So different oils can increase or decrease absorption. Um, kind of the summary of that. Mm -hmm. The dosing. So this is Epidiolox, um, and this is how they dosed it for their serious seizure disorders. Um, it's generally 10 to 20 mg per kg per day. So if you weigh about 60 kilograms, expect about 60 to 120 milligram doses of CBD. Now you'll see this in the topical pain creams on the markets, and what they'll do is they'll just have this box of CBD and they'll say 200 milligrams CBD. 
full spectrum, for example. So full spectrum means has more THC content in it. Still under 0.3%, but it has some in it. So when you have something like that, you'll see it'll say 200 milligrams or 400 or 500, and they'll sell it for X amount of dollars. And, you know, a lot of people look at that number when they purchase. Oh, this is 400 milligrams. Oh, this is 500 milligrams. One thing to take away is, is the fact that this is your, you, you need to know how much is in it per dose. So if you have a huge jug of about, and they say it's 1,000 milligrams versus you have a very tiny container and it's 100 milligrams, well, the concentration matters. You know, how much concentration, how much you get per, on your skin, you need to actually get the gram amount on your skin to, to, for the transdermal effect. When you're, uh, it's, a, it's a marketing ploy a lot of people do um, that got the CBD industry in a lot of trouble is where they would, people would say, oh, I have this huge jug of like, thousand two thousand milligrams but if the con if you actually concentrate or if you actually look at it you're not getting that much out of it because it's very dilute now this is per dose i want i want to remind people that 600 milligram this is like the one dose not the whole container but again this is for your anti-seizure medication so obviously it's going to be concentrated a lot higher now epidiolux comes in two it comes in an oral it will mainly in an oral solution and you know, that, and they put it in about 100 milligrams per milliliter solution. So you probably need to drink about at least, you can do the math there, like six, six milliliters or, or 12, um, and that's your daily dose uh, versus what you see in the market. Again, it's kind of a different, different conversation. Shows you more in lines of the problems with even researching CBD is concentrating it and figuring out what doses actually do anything. That's that's one of the one challenge in issues going through THC. Um, so that comes in a solution and a tablet. So the drop, the nobinol, it's like t um, two tablets, about 10 grams. I see that this is a little deceiving here. Um, not two to 10 grams. It's you, you take the tablets twice daily about, Oh, I'm sorry, two, two 10 gram tablets. So they come in a two and a half, a five and a 10 gram tablet. And then you can take that BID. So, um, you could also do the solution, which is about five milligrams per milliliter solution. Um, that. Now to talk about the adverse effects of CBD. This is based off of the Epidiolox research, um, again, from up to date. Some of the important things that you must take into consideration is the first one, um, first and foremost, is your hepatocellular injury. So it's really important that if you have a patient on CBD, one of the things that you must have them do it because if they're going to take it and they're going to take it anyway and you know instead of if if the conversation of you know that they're doing it and there's nothing you know that can be you know you, know, you have a patient seem to be doing it it is important for them to check in with their primary care physician um, it's important to check out the liver functional tests your asts and your alts they'll show liver injury because that's where it's metabolized and it cut and it can cause damage in that area. Um, you have to screen in general when they come, if they've had nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain in the past couple of months while on CBD, these are some things that should ra definitely raise eyebrows, definitely need to be monitored. Look for yellow skin. If you see that their skin or their eyeballs are yellow, signs of jaundice, not a good thing. Uh, if they've had dark urine, also not a good thing. These are all things that indicate that they definitely need some follow-up. Um, they might have something going on with their liver, n must be screened. Um, the other thing is ask about what kind of jobs they hold. Are they, do they operate huge machinery? Because somnol uh, somnolence and sedation, big, uh, what, big side effects of this. Um, the other thing is it's because it acts, the, the, the way it acts, the suicidal thinking and, you know, People on mood spectrum disorders, they have a lot of anxiety, um, bipolar, suicidal ideation, um, psychosis, any of these things, any mental health concerns definitely need to be followed up by, um, by a physician. Um, the general side effects when started on this drug um, central is gen central, uh, this is dronobinol, so this is the THC analog now. Um, euphoria, so it's an anti-emetic 24%, and appetite stimulation. So this is, 
over 10% side effects. Now there's the under 10% of the time side effects, which I didn't really go into. These are, I just wanted to stick to the most common to see what actually stick in the talk. So this slide, um, what I wanted to talk about on this slide is a little bit more about your, the CBD and THC consumption during the pandemic um, and what you should tell your patients. Because again, based off of what I've mentioned earlier and some of the, the, the science behind a lot of this is people are taking this for health benefits. Oh, it stops the cytokine storming. So it's probably good for COVID or it's good for respiratory tract infections or it's an anti-inflammatory, a great supplement. Everybody should just take it every single day. You got to hold back here and tell your patients, no, that's not, not a good thing. Um, the, some of the most information we got from the Epidiolox study is that 30% uh, patients were had 30% more uh, infections were over 30% more common than those receiving CBD versus the placebo. And among the infections you had your viral um, and your viral and just general pneumonia, I guess pneumonia can be caused by virus or bacteria. They had the largest um, increases for the 10 and 20 milligram um, kg per day versus placebo. So again, this touches back on the CBD hit the TH, uh, CB, D, CB2 receptors. Probably here's some evidence for it um, that it has some sort of immune modulation. Now, the interesting f thing for me on this is maybe further research study, you could actually use this for, you know, an inpatient, if somebody does have active COVID and they are in the immune storming phase, for example, and a doctor wants to try it as a research thing in addition to dexamethasone or independently or whatever, that's a separate conversation and that's what people are citing research studies like that. They're citing it on the news, but then the problem is when you go to the media and you say to the news, people read that as, oh, well, CBD cures COVID. No, that's not at all. It's just saying because of its immune modulatory effects, maybe this could be used as something for when a patient is about to storm already has a drug. But it's almost similar to taking a steroid where you'll depress your immune system, if anything, and that'll increase your the chances of you getting an infection from it. So in that light, I would say no to people taking it at this time, or at least be very aware that it increases your risk for um, respiratory infections, um, and just, just infections in general. Here are some of the drug-drug interactions. Again, this is um, some of the enzymes that are used to uh, clear the CBD. You have your CYPs, um, and here's a whole list of them. And this list will get overwhelming. I don't expect anybody to memorize all of this. Um, so maybe pictures will kind of help out. Um, you have your CYP inducers, um, and then you have your CYP um, inhibitors. Um, so the inducers may actually, or the, well, the inducers would probably clear CBD out of the system more because if you increase the enzyme activity in the liver, you're going to kill more of the CBD. Um, if you decrease the enzyme activity, and you'll probably increase the concentration of CBD. Now, the way to think about these interactions is you have different drugs that are inducers and that are inhibitors of these enzymes in your liver. Now, what that means is if you have somebody that's, for example, has heart failure or something and is taking a medication that, or it's a bleeding conference disorder that increases uh, or decreases the amount of coagulation in your blood, um, this could interfere with that in some regard to make them more hypercoagulable or less. So again, extremely important for physician to be on board to kind of monitor what drugs they're taking and the side effect profile when interacting with CBD or THC. Um, kind of an easier way to, so if you're a provider and a patient comes in, for me, I always like to think of few things that are important to kind of go through the screening process and what everybody I would say should take away. And while trying to remember all of these is nice, I don't really think it's too practical. So a red these are some of the easy to remember red flags. Uh, depression or mood disorders. If, so if you have a patient that comes in with a depression or mood disorder, any sort of, sort of psychiatric disorder, including anxiety, bipolar, psychosis, any of these things, th that's one of the red flags. They have heart failure. 
Again, it may require increasing the dosing of the blood thinner if they're on it. If they have a history of seizures at all, the anti-epileptic drugs, notorious for interacting with the CYP system. Um, and if they're alcoholics, um, alcohol hits the liver pretty hard. So you can see that where, where you definitely need some follow-up there. Um, again, these are just a, an, it, this is an adverse effect breakdown. Um, I like charts and just kind of more organization of, of, of these things to kind of remember it. These are dose dependent. Um, so again, central nervous system depression, you can see in effect appears with your sleeping, fatigue, sedation, drowsiness, dermatol uh, derm, so you get, there's some people with some skin rashes, um, GI, you can decrease the appetite, even though it's, yeah. Um, and these are some of the less likely ones, which I'll kind of gloss over. Um, other considerations, um, THC does cross the placenta. So um, it is found in breast milk. And um, oh, this is with a 60 gram high fat meal. It'll peak four hours longer in the blood. So this is kind of reverting back to what I uh, previously mentioned about the lipophilic nature of the drug. Um, so now the question is, let's see my timing. So now the question is, based off of medical cannabis, can we capture a realistic picture of CBD? So based off of some of the research that we had, how bad is marijuana? And from that, can we kind of predict how bad CBD is? That was the way that I was thinking about it. And because I, I think about it as the marijuana plant is the more concentrated THC, more of the effects, more of you know the things that are more potent. Um, and then the CBD, you're kind of isolating one cannabinoid, the, the CBD one, or maybe with the full spectrum, different cannabinoids. So if I knew the really bad of cannabis, can I kind of predict in the future what the really bad of CBD is? So this is kind of a little um, thought trial, but one perspective, one prospective cohort study uh, that was following about 430 patients with chronic pain compared um, them using medical cannabis with non-users found no difference in serious adverse effects. Um, a lot of these, again, are based off of up-to-date uh, up reviewed uh, stuff. So the, the medical cannabis group did have a higher rate of non-serious respiratory adverse effects, but the long-term effect, long effects, I guess, would say grossly unknown. During the study, no serious adverse effects that happened. So, when looking at cannabis, the way I'd like to hone in is, and when people get very scared with the topic or um, they don't know a lot about it, it's, it's good to kind of hone in on it to understand realistically how, what, what we're dealing with here. Um, so for the 2 million total disability adjusted life years due to substance use disorders, um, individual substance use disorders were found 47% with alcohol, opioids 24%, amphetamines around 7%, cannabis 5.5%, cocaine 2.9%. 2 so it's a very small pro uh, proportion of the global burden of disease relative to the other ones. Um, again, this is uh, up, up to date. Again, all of, and here are some of, more of the sources of, of what I'm talking about here. So large-scale cross-sectional epidemiological studies and smaller prospective studies found cannabis used to be associated with serious or chronic, had not found cannabis used to be associated with serious or chronic medical conditions or death. A uh, systemic review of 19 published studies found no evidence of the association between heavy cannabis use and adverse health outcomes except for fatal uh, motor vehicle crashes. And a 2016 40-year longitudinal cohort study in Sweden with 50,000 military townships did find a small association between heavy cannabis use um, uh, at, and overall mortality. So there's some there, but is it strong and overwhelming? Unsure yet. More research is needed. So <clears throat> what are the long-term effects of marijuana that we know of in terms of different systems? So for the brain structure and function, um, so this is a systemic review of 56 published neuroimaging studies of the brain structure and function in, a, in adult cannabis users. They found consistent evidence of reduced hippocampal volume and lower hippocampal gray matter density, but there's no change in overall brain volume size. Um, 
and the evidence for changes in other regions of the brain was inconsistent or inconclusive. Um, for the psychosocial impact for kids under 16, so the, this re systemic review of 16 higher quality prospective laundry tools found consistent associations for cannabis use with lower educational attainment, and it found it as an increased use for of other illegal drugs. So um, that's one thing that we have to take into consideration is the children, people under 16, and the, you know, the gateway conversation, which is, you know, this is, that's what that research kind of taps into. Now, a prospective study from a thousand French young adults, 22 to 35, who had been followed for 19 years and found the initiation of cannabis at around 16 was associated with failure um, by the age of 16, so under 16, failure to attain a high school degree and cannabis use. Um, but, however, the caveat here is that if they started after 16, then the educational attainment comparable to non-users um, is about the same. So the thought is, under 16, the side effects and the, the impacts of cannabis use on a developing brain could be significant. Um, and that's a little bit of the summary there. In terms of memory, um, they found that verbal memory was impaired, but there was no impairment of the processing speed or executive function. Um, and this is, yeah. Criminal behavior, um, the systemic review, again, um, they found inconsistent associations for cannabis use with, of course, uh, psychological health and, or with a problematic or criminal um, behavior. So it's just like another review, another study showing some of these things. The neuropsychological effects. So it impairs a variety of neuropsychological functions in a dose-dependent manner, especially attention, concentration, episodic memory, and association. But the association between regular use and the long-term neurocognitive deficits is mixed. So again, I think the summary on this one is need more research. We really need to figure out more um, about these effects. So association with psychosis. We know that if you use a lot of cannabis, it can cause the transient acute psychosis. Um, but can that cause long-term schizophrenia? And the answer to that is grossly unknown. We're not really sure um, if you can do that. Um, there, you know, there is an increased risk for psychosis in this here's a systemic uh, review of 35 studies, longitudinal studies. Not, they did find an increased risk for psychosis, a significant dose response relationship um, with twofold increase in the ones that use cannabis most. So people taking it multiple, multiple times a day. Um, yeah, that's where you'll see more of that. Um, and then in the Finland study, there's 6,500 individuals in North Finland this is in 1986. Um, and their increase, they had, if, if they had taken um, it by the age of 15 to 16 compared to those who, who were never used, um, th they found an increased risk of psychosis. But if you took it after the age of 15 to 16, there was no increased risk. Who, this is for children. For, people greater than 16 years old who took cannabis more than four times. So if you've taken it more than four times, um, after the age of 16, no associated risk um, with psychosis, under 16 or multiple times, increased risk. So for pain, now this is, this is where a lot of the stuff comes in. This is where a lot of your anecdotal evidence comes in. This is where a lot of patient feedback comes in where they're, a lot of people are on it, they swear by it. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So here are just some studies that um, kind of indicate yes or no or what's going on. So from the National Academics of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, they found significant reduction in chronic pain, the use of cannabis or cannabinoids. In 2018 meta-analysis, um, moderate evidence that can uh, cannabis reduced pain by 30%. However, they found a lot of adverse effects with it, and the number needed to treat was pretty high. It was around 24. So before we get into this, I probably should have talked about this before this, but um, the major pain modalities, and just kind of a way to break it down for me when I see people, this is an oversimplification, but I think it's pretty, you know, a pretty useful one. Um, when I see patients with pain, the first thing I'd like to think about is the timeline of this pain. Is this something that's been going on for a long time, chronic? 
Is this something that happened in the past couple of days? Cute. What is the nature of the pain? Um, so again, they're saying this is more, CBD will be more of the chronic pain. The other type of pain, the way I like to break it down is, is this inflammatory versus neuropathic. So is this something, when we're talking about inflammatory, is there redness, is there heat, is there swelling, loss of function? Um, can you see it, touch it, that kind of stuff, inflammatory pain versus neuropathic relating to the nerves. So pain that travels, pain that is uh, maybe upper motor neurons, so something central. You have your phantom limb pain. You have your, you see, there's, there's a lot going on with, with that. So trying to identify what type of pain a person is experiencing, a little challenging. You know, the heat... With uh, patients with hemophilia, it's going to be your hemarthrosis, be more your inflammatory pain. Feel the joint, feel the warmth, feel the swelling. Versus uh, neuropathic, could be long-term, and it could be other etiologies related, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so here's just a brief literature search. Um, again, these are just studies that you can kind of look into. A lot of them have the confounding. They're, I wouldn't call them strong, strong. Um, but, you know, they're interesting reads nonetheless. Um, so the first, you know, one of the first, and you can look up some of these articles um, if you're interested. Uh, so Bruno et al. for the cannabinoid delivery systems, did they find pain release? Yes. Interesting comment, comments about it. Combining existing formulations with CBD may produce rapid system effects and long-term outcomes. Another one for WIPA formulations of argon oil and, cannab and cannabidol. So this is when we're talking about the carrier oils, and does that improve um, the ability for pain reduction? The answer is yes. For the topical formulations, again, it's specifically argon oil and CBD and using it in inflammatory disorders, including arthritis and dermatitis. So they did find stuff in that study. Um, the Nimbixamol, this is t not available in the, UH, uh, in the United States. It is a, a THC analog. Did they find pain reduction? Yes. Um, and the drug is mainly used for spasticity and neuropathic pain associated with multiple sclerosis and cancer. Another article with O'Brien and Cannabis <clears throat> uh, um, found the alleviation of osteoarthritis. Um, so pain relief, yes, and it showed the in, uh, innate endocannabinoid system plays a role in modulating arthritis pathophysiology and pain. Again, the, locally, this is, you know, these are just some, some shows, uh, some evidence for these. Um, again, but, you know, you make sure to read into the studies and you'll see um, the different study parameters, how it was made. And, yeah. So now other things, based off of a lot of these studies, and we went into the study talk about the other things that it do, and we kind of talked about this, does this treat COVID-19? Um, no, possible immune suppressive, increased infection, prophylactic use can predispose respiratory infection. So again, I had mentioned this a little bit earlier. So now to dive into, let me check my time, to dive into the legal status of uh, marijuana or hemp. So in general, when you have your marijuana plant, your hemp, your THC, federally not legal, you can get in trouble for having it on a federal level. I know some states have legalized it locally. Um, if you go to Venice Beach in California, people are selling it, in, you know, just on the streets. Um, you go into other states, no, federally, no, marijuana. Mm. Um, but then you have your hemp, your hemp and your extracts, as long as it is under 0.3% THC, federally legal. Um, and you can go to Amazon, you can see it there. Um, a lot of these sources now are just straight from the FDA website. Um, so marijuana is schedule one to its high po potential for abuse. Um, and that's in part by the psychoactive effects of THC and the absence of currently accepted medical use of the plant in the United States. I know we talked about drobinol, but that's a synthetic analog of THC. More to teach us about the understanding of how THC works and the side effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is, but the plant, no. Um, but the farm bill in the FDA defines hemp. So it defines, um, defined it as the plant cannabis sativa and any part of the plant, um, including the seeds, the derivatives, the extracts, the isomers, acids, salts, et cetera, et cetera, that have no more than 0.3% of THC on a dry weight basis. So this removes hemp from um, the Schedule One, which means that it's federally legal. Um, it, the FDA treats products containing cannabis or cannabis 
like that uh, to the same regulating authority as FDA product, regulated products containing anything else. So this was kind of the peak of my interest into this material was really not the marijuana or the THC or, or that. It was more so about the CBD. And, you know, it's a federal legal. So now what can be made of it? What, where, where's, where will we be heading with this um, formulation? Um, this is more about the market. How do people sell this thing? Can you buy it? Um, marketing claims. So one of the major problems in the CBD industry is the marketing claims. Right now, the only thing CBD was approved for was Epidiolox for um, Lennox gastrointestinal seizures and Dravet syndrome. Um, so childhood epilepsies, it's not indicated, there's not strong evidence that it, it removes pain. There's not strong evidence that it, um, you know, puts you to sleep. It's pre predominantly, um, uh, predominantly anecdotal or some of the small studies. So we do need more of a full, big, large scale study with appropriate dosing, with appropriate um, parameters to actually see, hmm. Now, how can people sell this as a drug or do they? Sometimes what you, people do is they'll link it with some evidence-based materials and get an OTC license. So, but in general, this isn't really the way it's seen. So this is again why the, where the regulations come in where you can't say this, that, or that about it because as far as the FDA is concerned, it doesn't do any of those things and that's just false marketing. This is... In your form. Oh, so here's some of this. So some people try to sell it as a supplement. Uh, so can people sell it as a supplement or can you purchase it as a supplement or if you go to a vitamin store? It, I think it's important to know these laws as a consumer um, and as a healthcare provider because it kind of shows you a little bit about the places you're buying it from and the people you're buying it from. For me, if somebody's not being fully transparent or fully honest about one thing, Mm, then you, you know, how how much do you even trust what's in that product? There is no regulation right now on any of these products to see out on the market what, what people are taking and what's actually in the product, what's actually not in the product, none of that. So anytime I see something that is a little shady, then you can assume the worst almost. That's that's the way I go about it. But people try to sell it as a supplement that's also not legal. Um, you know, is it legal to consume? Um, it is, is it legal to sell? Depends, uh, this is from the FDA website, on the intended use, how it is labeled and marketed. So for the FDA with CBD, their predominant concern, um, more than anything, is how it's labeled and how it's sold. You know, are they making some of these false claims or are they not? Um, yeah. Uh, can you sell it as a cosmetic product? Yes, so this is with a lot of the topical pain creams People will say, for example, let's just say you have a moisturizing lotion that is helps moisturize your skin and you like the feeling on it or whatever, and it happens to have the ingredient CBD in it. That's kind of where the mar you know, where you can go about it that way. Now, is this a product that has pain relieving qualities once topically applied? Now you're getting into the no go zones. Um, is it legal to sell in food? So this is an interesting conversation because it is shown in, um, you have the CBD gummies, which are kind of taking the, the you know, they, these are very popular right now. A lot, of, you're gonna, a lot of people take it to help them with sleep. And what they'll do is they'll take these full spectrum CBD gummies. They'll take 50 milligrams per dose um, and just to knock out. And you know, it, right now it's, 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 if it's in food, you're not supposed to do it. So I'm, I'm actually interested to see how this is going to be in the future because um, where the laws and the clarification by the FDA is probably going to be coming sometime in the near future to see where, you know, if those are still going to be on the shelves or not, not entirely sure. But the, these are all over the place now. And yeah. So example, some of the false claims, again, it cures cancer, it cures this, it cures that. I think knowing what it actually does is important. Um, again, so people are very convinced that they're that it's true, and they cite research, and the research that they cite predominantly animal studies or one or two clinical trials. Again, not the way to, um, you know, just being able to explain weak evidence versus strong evidence, outdated publications, and this goes for really anything, not just 
um, the world of CBD. Um, and now kind of a little bit in the marketing, what it kind of goes for. You can see these prices, by the way. These are outrageous prices, $39.99, $40, $50, $60. We'll spend a lot of money on these products. Um, so if you do have patients that are doing it, how can you advise them of what to buy? How packaging, the different forms, like what, or even understand it, not to advise them to purchase it or not, but, um, you know, where do you, where do you even get grounded on this? So again, so there's, this is kind of going in the topical creams, their price range. Um, <laughs> you can see that I added the price range to a lot of these so people can get an understanding of how much this is going to break their bank. Um, but you know, they come in the tinctures up to $200, uh, people inhaling it, um, vapes, uh, vapes are associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I hope nobody's taking any vapes at all. Um, and in, this is back to the gummies, sorry, full spectrum, just little isolate. Um, so how do you tell them what to buy? This is kind of where I was uh, before. So the brands are resources. In general, with any herbal remedies, they, per up to date, they recommend these, um, the display a seal of approval for you. But I can tell you right now, CBD companies aren't really going here. So, and how are you gonna tell a patient to remember a lot of these? Um, the two things that I would say to look for are CGMP certifications and certifications of analysis. So when you're dealing with these different products, um, like these, make sure that the company that, you're, that your patients are going to, see if it comes from a CG, if they're taking it. You know, they're taking it anyway, and you know, they've checked with their primary care physician, and you know, they're, they're purchasing it, purchasing it. Make sure that the products that they have are the CGMP certified, which means that it, uh, a nonprofit organization actually tests the product and sees that it's okay. Um, and then that it has the certificates of analysis. So a lot of these companies will publish their certificates of, certifications of analysis. Now, what is a certification of analysis and why is that important? Certification of analysis means it's been independently reviewed and they will tell you the concentration of CBD in it, the concentration of THC in it, and the concentration of everything. Because you know you don't wanna be in a situation where it's CBD and then maybe somebody put extra THC in it or, or something like that. Um, yeah, those are, those are important uh, implications for that. So let me see. Yeah, so those are, those are probably the two things that I would make sure that the, the people, if they're consuming it, um, to look at that. But again, yeah. Um, so future research, where do I see this field going? Um, and my curiosity as a researcher, where would I want more investigations to come in? I think it'd be interesting to do research on it as well, and uh, or for other people to have ideas out there that want to be aspiring researchers. Um, maybe CBD in patients with cardiac heart failure. You know, they can't take non-steroidals for pain relief. What do they have? Hmm. Um, you know, if you properly dose it with their anticoagulation drugs and they're followed by, for example, a cardiologist or something like that, you know, maybe the cardiology world can do some research into that to see with proper dosing, with proper this, how it could work. And patients with hemophilia, hopefully we'll have some uh, abstracts or some something coming soon uh, to do some further investigation on it. Uh, CBD is a treatment for insomnia. I, I actually do see potential for this, um, just based anecdotally off people. Well, I mean, it's really anecdotal, it's really anecdotal, but also seeing as depressive effects and maybe some of the mechanisms, I could see this as something um, as a potential Peripheral artery disease, that's another interesting one um, with the anti-blood vessel properties of it. I think it'd be pretty interesting. And then in different forms of dermatitis. So this is where I would say future research should be kind of dictated. Not that it does any of these things. I'm just, this is like curiosity. So, and that's, I believe it. Thank you, Khalid. That was incredibly thorough and you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it, uh, just really informative and sobering as well since we're on the so subject but i wanted to drill down a little on this the transdermal effect because we are having patients that are using the, the, the uh, using it transdermally as creams or whatever to uh, to get some pain relief mm -hmm. and uh, we're hearing some anec anecdotal evidence that it, it is helping but my concern is uh, we have an aging population 
uh, of people with some pretty bad hemarthropathies. And, but we also have an aging population of, uh, of community members in general. My mother was asking about it. She's got very bad OA of the knees. And I wasn't sure about the transdermal effects or the oral effects. And you seem to explain that, you know, you want to beware of the, the full spectrum stuff when you're using it transdermally, particularly with people who are at fall risk, which our, our hemophilia uh, community is. Um, or even our younger people who have to drive. Um, what, what kind of advice and guidance would you give to somebody uh, who wants to use uh, something like that and what should we watch out for? You know, I would definitely, definitely, definitely have them talk to their primary care provider about it because of the, some of the side effects, you know, especially fall risks. You have the somnolence in your sedation, don't operate heavy machinery, which are very clearly researched with looking at the epidiolox, the, C, the CBD um, that, that has had a lot of research behind it. Very important for patients to do that, to make sure that, um, that they understand that. And then particularly in elderly over 70, I mean, in general, even antihistamines um, are contraindicated. You don't want to give someone um, that because, you know, a fall could potentially end a person's life, especially over 70, over 80. So it's very important, I would say, to make sure that they're being followed by a physician um, to, to kind of understand and to monitor them throughout that entire process. Um, really, really important. And, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive to a patient when they think, well, if I ingest it, it's, I'm probably far more likely to feel the effects. But uh, in terms of the pharmacokinetics, uh, we actually have something to fear from actually uh, improper application of transdermal uh, right. uh, yeah, doses. So, and remember, transdermal, I, think, I think one thing that I even made the mistake of initially um, when I first started looking into CBD is I was like, hmm, well, if it's transdermal, does it just act locally or can it act centrally? Well, you saw with the volume of distribution in it right. that if you do apply it topically, you could get some central response to it. So don't think that, you know, if it's like, oh, it's just knee pain. I'm going to add a lot of this to my knee and I won't feel any systemic effects. I would pause because, you know, right now the research is not overwhelmingly out. I mean, we are estimating about 45% transdermal. We really mainly know oral, um, you know, the oral uh, thing of it. So yeah, definitely, definitely go with caution. Um, so maybe, would you go more for the isolates, obviously more towards an isolate type of formulation as opposed to a, a fuller spectrum? I, I would probably, in terms of safety, if they're doing it and they're using it anyway, it'd be more the isolate. Um, anecdotally, I've heard the full spectrum is the one that actually works, and the isolate does absolutely uh, nothing. So uh, you have to, there is that caveat. But, but again, a lot of the product, the problem with a lot of these products is they're overall review and their dosing, the evidence has not come out with a proper transdermal dosing form. So you don't really know, you know, with the full spectrum, it's again, it's less than 0.3% THC, you get a more spectrum of cannabinoids. But again, that's in my mind as a clinician, I'm, that's also more side effects we probably don't know about yet. So that's, that's my hesitation um, in that at the moment. Khalid Namus, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Bruno Steiner. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you for having me.